Welcome back to the last part of the series and the most important one in terms of debunking the main arguments in favor of green capitalism with evidence. This is the outline. The part in red is what this video is about. If you want to have a firm grasp on this topic, I recommend you check out part 1 and 2 to be able to better contextualize what is discussed in this video and to more fully understand the climate crisis and what causes it. So let's get started. Technological solutionism is a comforting approach. But the idea that technological progress will save the world is more than just comforting. It's a narrative that benefits one class over the other, and thus finds itself in the mass media and the policy papers of capitalist governments. The belief that green technology will save the planet is just that, a belief. There is no evidence for this claim. Our current technology is very limited and the potential for technology in the future is uncertain. Climate change experts have long debunked and warned against this belief. When it comes to climate disaster, we can't rely on beliefs which are unsubstantiated. We must act now and do whatever is necessary. And let me remind you of the illustration I showed in part 2. If we keep growing the economy, renewables will not mean an energy transition, they are just an energy addition. A little known technological solution, but one which has been seen for a long time as the climate change savior technology, is BEX, or bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. It's an energy system which is supposed to pull carbon out of the atmosphere by establishing massive tree plantations around the world to pull the carbon out of the air. Then you burn those trees or other biomass to generate energy, while capturing the resulting CO2 in a long-term underground storage. When an Austrian academic, Michael Obersteiner, published this idea in a paper in 2001, there was zero evidence that this could actually work, but the mere possibility of such a scheme sent the pro-capitalists into a frenzy. Finally, someone came up with the genius technology to reduce carbon emissions and keep capitalism. The incredible thing about this is that, despite the utter lack of any evidence, even the IPCC started including BEX in its official models. BEX was put in the IPCC's fifth assessment report of 2014 as the dominant assumption. And guess what? The famous Paris Agreement relies mainly on that report, which helps answering why those pledges overshoot the 2 degrees Celsius goal. Everyone is putting their faith in BEX. Nobody has heard of this technology. No worker has agreed to this but we're supposed to trust it with the future of our planet. What are the problems of BEX? First of all, BEX has never been proven to work at a large scale. The infrastructure which would need to be built would surpass almost any infrastructure project in human history. Several climate scientists have spoken against BEX and called it a dangerous distraction or extremely risky and have described negative emission technologies as gambling. But secondly, even if it can be pulled off, it would likely cause severe food shortages and famines. Even Obersteiner himself questioned this technology. He never meant it to be seen as the savior technology. People have misused his idea. All he proposed was sort of an additional technology to help reduce emissions. Fortunately, the IPCC listened to the critiques and they removed the assumption in their special report released in 2018. The report now made a radical statement. Carbon emissions need to be cut in half by 2030 to keep global warming below 1.5 and that we can't possibly rely on these negative emission technology schemes if we want to have a chance to achieve that. Solar geoengineering or solar radiation management is probably the outlandish technique of outlandish techniques. 
It is about injecting aerosol through flying jets and creating a giant veil around the Earth to reflect sunlight back to space. Not only is this ineffective, but it is incredibly dangerous. Scientists have called on governments to prevent normalization of solar geoengineering as an option in climate policy. So what about nuclear power? Nuclear power will have to play its part, but it can only be a small part, setting aside all risk of nuclear. The problem is that it takes a very long time to build a new power plant, 10 years on average. Experts say that nuclear power plants are not very scalable and take a massive amount of resources. As with other power generation technologies, it is an important part of the solution, but it is not the solution. There's a general misconception about green or clean energy, because it's not really green or clean. Yes, wind is clean and sunshine is clean, but solar panels and wind turbines aren't. Demand for lithium alone is projected to go up to 40 million tons by 2050, a staggering 2,700% increase over current levels of extraction, in order to approach net zero for 2050. And these are just the numbers for electricity. So what about electric cars? To switch to electric vehicles has been promoted as a major and necessary step to reduce carbon emissions. Every electric vehicle, and most hybrid vehicles, rely on large lithium-ion batteries weighing hundreds of kilos. We have to remember here that lithium extraction is an ecological nightmare. It takes half a million gallons of water to produce a single ton of lithium. Consider the massive problems lithium is already causing for communities where it is located. In the Andes, where most lithium reserves are located, Farmers are regularly displaced from their land due to the environmental degradation caused by lithium mining. Studies show that future demand for electric vehicles will outstrip the supply of known mineral reserves, such as cobalt, by more than 400% by 2050. Mining is already a disaster for ecosystems. It causes biodiversity loss or deforestation, and the mining explosion has barely even started. Yes, electric vehicles are superior to gasoline-powered vehicles when it comes to their emissions impact. But remember that there needs to be a rapid reduction in emissions. Yet, the total market for electric vehicles is growing massively, and so is the total market for cars, in general. But we don't need more cars, we need less of them. Even if every single car went electric by 2030, which isn't possible, under the assumption that all production was carbon neutral, which isn't possible either, the reductions would be far below the 50% we need to cut. And this is all under the assumption, of course, that GDP would stop growing, which isn't happening either. The transportation sector makes up 26% of global greenhouse gas emissions with around 75% of these emissions originating from road transportation. Yet, corporate media and capitalist governments are pushing the story that as long as all transportation goes electric, everything will be fine. After all, the more cars are sold, the more surplus value there is to be appropriated. There is far less money to be made with trains and buses, because the superior efficiency would entail selling less metal per person. It is a well-known fact that prioritizing pedestrian and a public transit system results in higher social and economic prosperity around the world. And it is estimated that switching from a car to public transit will reduce a person's CO2 emissions by over four times. It's interesting to see how this economic basis has an effect on culture, with cars being seen as high status and cool while public transport is associated with a lower status. And it's very easy to always blame the individual, but we don't make decisions in a vacuum. If public transit has a great quality and is very cheap, more people use it. And the reason it isn't is systemic. Public transit in the UK is one of the most expensive in the world. UK households spend about 
13% of their annual income on transportation. Privatization of the UK rail system is well known, and the according increase in prices and government subsidies are well documented. Providing a free or very cheap public transport system would be very easy if it weren't for the owners of those companies making a huge profit from this. Or the CEOs of the Swiss state-owned railway company who earn over $1 million per year. Electric cars, self-driving cars or the Tesla tunnel system are in direct competition with public transit. So it's not surprising that the biggest backers of self-driving cars, for instance, are the same people who make a lot of money selling cars or operating on them. Lobbying from car manufacturers has increased significantly over the past decades, with money flowing into various areas of transportation to increase highway funding, or paying YouTubers to push how cool and how not dangerous self-driving technology is. Or intense lobbying efforts to push for a more car-friendly street design in cities. There are strong barriers that have been erected to make leaving our dependency on the automobile nearly impossible. Elon Musk likes to say that he wants to stay out of politics, but his company spent millions of dollars per year on lobbying efforts. And this makes perfect sense from the perspective of capitalists, because the more people have to rely on cars, the more they will spend on the broader ecosystem of cars, regardless of its environmental impact. Obviously, it's better to have more self-driving cars instead of regular ones. If self-driving worked and if the technology were owned by workers. But cars, including electric or self-driving cars, have far higher energy requirements than any other mode of transportation due to the energy per mile and person throughput. Car manufacturers like to posture publicly by claiming to be part of the transition to a more sustainable world. Their lobbying dollars tell a different story. In a world of climate disaster, the last thing we need is even more car infrastructure. To conclude, the transition is crucial, but it's a drop in the ocean compared to what needs to be done in order to reduce total energy demand and doing so in a way that doesn't devastate communities around the world. But the dominant narrative in the mainstream media is that this transition to renewables is enough, which is one big lie and a massive distraction, serving to ensure and even boost capitalist profits in the new exploding markets while fooling the masses that it will save the planet. This narrative is beyond ridiculous because there's no need for further GDP growth to achieve the transition to renewables. And more importantly, the capitalist governments themselves do not seem to want this transition. Today, the world is producing 8 billion more megawatt hours of clean energy per year than in the year 2000 which is quite a big increase. But over the same period, energy demand has grown by 48 billion megawatt hours, which means that new clean energy covers a mere 16% of new demand. Even if clean energy tripled here, it would do exactly nothing to decrease carbon emissions. Or as Jason Hickel puts it in Less is More, quote, it's like shoveling sand into a pit that just keeps getting bigger. At projected growth rates, the economy will be twice as big by 2050. It's already very hard to transition to 100% renewables today, and it's twice as impossible to do so in the near future. As scientists put it, it is, quote, well outside of what is currently deemed achievable. Green growth proponents have a smart idea about this problem, though. Why not just grow GDP while reducing material use? Let's look at why the green capitalism people think green growth is possible. They swear by the concept of decoupling. In 2019, the EU introduced the European Green Deal with the goal to reach climate neutrality by 2050 and to decouple resource use from economic growth. 
Decoupling just means that you can increase GDP while decreasing material use or carbon emissions to decouple them. Relative decoupling just means that the growth in carbon emissions or material use is slower than the growth in GDP. While absolute decoupling is a reduction of carbon emissions or environmental pressure in general while GDP is growing. Now, if you've read a little bit into this, you have likely heard this claim that decoupling has been possible. Let's look at the evidence for this. First, let's look at material use. Have states achieved a reduction in the use of materials in production, plastics, metal, timber, and so on? Unsurprisingly, Defenders of the status quo are in a quick rush to point out single instances which seemingly confirm their worldview. For instance, proponents showed how domestic material consumption has been decreasing or stagnating along with an increasing GDP in a number of high-income countries, such as the US, Britain or Japan. Those journalists were quick to announce that this was proof of decoupling. Capitalism can be green after all. However, there was a little problem with this data. It included consumption, but not the material involved in production. Because the imperialist nations have outsourced so much of their manufacturing to low-income countries, they were able to remove that part of resource use out of their balance sheets. So in order to account for this, researchers use the so-called material footprint. Using this metric, we can see that material consumption has risen dramatically, even outpacing GDP growth. So it turns out there was no decoupling. It was just a misreading of the data. Or a lie. I leave it up to you to conclude which it was. And what's worse is that material consumption increases with time. Because the cheap and easily recoverable oil and gas the stuff that is closer to the surface, including minerals and metals, is extracted first. And with time, it becomes harder and harder to get the same amount of materials from Earth. It's three times as hard today compared to a hundred years ago. The increase in fracking is a consequence of that. Okay, so what about services? As high-income nations move towards a service economy, Surely that's a sign that they're getting greener. As mainstream writers like to claim, life is different now. People use more Facebook or YouTube and they supposedly have zero effect on the GDP because their consumption is for free and they don't generate emissions. Turns out the shift to services has done nothing to reduce material use. High-income countries have still, by far, the highest per capita material footprints. But why is that? First of all, when the services sector grows, it does not follow that people make or buy less stuff. Services don't just not require any materials, like tourism for instance. And earning money from YouTube doesn't mean you don't spend it. It also doesn't mean that manufacturing or agriculture has gone away. It's just been increasingly outsourced to lower income places. Okay, so decoupling from material use fails. What about emissions? Is decoupling greenhouse gas emissions from GDP growth successful? Former Bloomberg opinion columnist Noah Smith, who likes to argue against economic growth critics and anyone vaguely left in general, says in his article that it is. He points out that growth is currently becoming greener in some high-income countries. So there is a bit of a trend toward relative decoupling and there is absolute decoupling in some rare cases. So is green growth happening? No. We have to keep in mind it's not just about if decoupling happens, but, and this is very, very, very important, if it happens fast enough to stay within the maximum 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius limit, as agreed in the Paris Agreement. If we look at the study GDP growth defenders like to cite, we see that what it really shows is that only 18 countries in the world, which is not very much, have managed to reduce their CO2 emissions a tiny little bit between 2005 and 2015, 
which is not that much, and part of that decrease is explained by a fall in GDP growth, and that progress has been slowing down. But remember that all of these emission reduction theories still assume that the negative emission technologies we've talked about are going to deliver. If you take these out, you'll realize that what we need is not a reduction of 1% per year, but the cuts need to be in the double digits, so 10 or 15% per year at least. And this is not even considering the necessary increase in emissions of low-income countries. One study found that some OECD countries managed to reduce emissions by 3.8% in 14 years. That is nothing. That is a reduction of 0.28% per year. There are also several problems with the data considered in these studies. For instance, most of them only take into account production-based measures. However, the ones that also consider a consumption-based perspective find much different results. And this is a big problem because many of these studies consider just territorial emissions and not consumption-based emissions and emissions from international trade. A 2017 report found that while territorial emissions declined by 13% during 1990 and 2010, the carbon footprint in that period increased by 8%. Other studies find the same when looking at places such as the UK or France. So NOAA's claims are not just scientifically unwarranted and not based on the overwhelming empirical evidence. They are dangerous. Economist Timothée Parik makes the analogy to the COVID pandemic. He says, imagine if people say that there is currently a decrease in positive cases in high-income nations, but that stat is not representative of all countries and it considers only a few states and that currently means only the last week or so. So, to conclude, remember that climate change is not just about emissions. Over 80% of decoupling studies focus only on either primary energy or CO2 emissions, but we don't know much about all the other destructive ecological effects. And keep in mind that what we need is a reduction like this not this. Even if all countries achieve decoupling rates of the UK, for instance, which isn't possible under the current system and the current state of technology, it would be nothing compared to what needs to be done to solve global warming. None of this is to say that technological progress isn't vital, but it alone, with the most optimistic scenarios, won't be enough in the short time we have. Technology isn't the problem, the mode of production is. Capitalist accumulation will eradicate the best efforts to transition to renewables. But telling people to not worry too much about GDP growth, because eventually it will magically decouple from environmental pressures, is not just devoid of material reality. It is irresponsible gambling, not just with the lives of humans, but with the lives of all species. So, capitalism can't be green. But can socialism be green? Socialism, to put it in simple terms, is a mode of production based on human needs, on use value, in which society owns the means of production as a whole, not capitalists who comprise a minority of people. It should be obvious that ecological concerns are part of those human needs, Clean water, clean air, fertile soil are all values which are useful to us. They are not external costs or external factors which are not calculated or very marginally calculated into the capitalist mode of production. One core difference is that society takes hold of productive forces and not the other way around. Society deliberately and consciously determines which use values are to be prioritized. Now, 
there is not necessarily an intrinsic imperative that a socialist society will pursue degrowth. However, there is an imperative in capitalism to pursue growth and to prevent crisis and to accumulate capital. So can socialism be unsustainable? It can, but it shouldn't if ecology is seen as part of the transformation to a mode of production geared towards satisfying human needs, which it should. But there can't be a sustainable capitalism. But all this pontification about what about socialism is not just lazy whataboutism. It is simply evading the problem by pointing out a potential weakness of an alternative social and economic system and distracting from an inherent one in the current. It's a lot like people saying, yeah, but corruption can happen under socialism too. Yes, but it's a significant difference if you systemically prevent corruption or you systemically encourage it. So does life under an ecological socialist society mean we all have to become wood folk and everybody working in agriculture. This is a common attempt by people to make communists or degrowthers look ridiculous. Of course, socialism means a progress from capitalism, using state-of-the-art technology, the internet, artificial intelligence, modern machinery, having more people work in science, and so on. An ecological society does not mean that people can't enjoy themselves. It's quite the contrary. One reason to make people focused on their individual behavior of consumption is to forget about the other side of it, which is production. All the time it's about reducing consumption and it's rarely about reducing labor. Scaling down industries results in massive unemployment because those who ultimately make the hiring and investment decisions are also the people who own the means of production and they do not care about the societal level of employment or improving the quality of jobs. However, if we societally plan the scaling down of harmful industries, we can allocate labor ourselves, regardless of profit. To illustrate this, let's consider the following thought experiment. Let's say you have a grocery business with eight employees. That business has just acquired two of these self-checkout machines which, let's say, double productivity, but which also reduce the amount of labor that has to be performed in order to run the store. And consequently, the business decides to fire half of the workers because they could now reduce costs. And why does the business do this? Of course, it was either to remain competitive in the marketplace by reducing costs or because they were one of the earlier ones to adopt this new technology to increase their market share or profit rate or all of those reasons together. So let's assume it was the latter. So costs are reduced and thus the surplus value is increased. But that increase in surplus value does not go to the workers. To the contrary, they likely experience an intensified, or to use the euphemism, a more efficient job. However, for the owner and their investors, returns have increased. Okay, so let's imagine a socialist system in which society determines labor and resource distribution through planning. Let's say that society wants to reduce labor time to be in line with the ecological limits of the planet at the current level of technology. So for simplicity's sake, let's say that it has been decided to have the necessary labor to keep the grocery store running. The individual capitalist doesn't care what happens to those who have lost their jobs. You fire them and good luck finding something else or good luck learning how to code or whatever. But now everyone has a guaranteed place where they can labor. Society can't or rather doesn't want to just fire half the people. So it doesn't fire anyone and it distributes labor differently. The people now labor four instead of eight hours for the same amount of remuneration or more. But how can we do this? 
We can do this because surplus value isn't appropriated by the profit maximizing store owner anymore because there is none. Income has been shifted from capital to labor, so to speak. So it doesn't follow that you receive less for your labor. You receive the same for half the labor in this case. Note that there is no loss of technology or productive value here. The potential for standard of living is the same in both cases. However, in the capitalist example, that increased potential is constantly appropriated by the owner. And in the socialist example, it is shared collectively. The progress in technology, the increase in productivity, directly benefits society. And it is not just some marginal trickle-down benefit, if there even is one. Under a competitive market economy, you can't do this. As a business, you are forced to follow the rules of the market. So you appropriate the surplus value and reinvest in additional checkout devices or just distribute it among your investors if there's a slump. The store in this example isn't just a democratically run cooperative among capitalist monopolies. The democratically owned business would be in direct competition for surplus value with monopoly capital. There would be limits to shortening the working day because you risk to go under in competition against more powerful monopolies. Under socialism, every other store is subject to society planning production as a whole. It is not just the single store operating on democratic principles. The whole productive structure is so to speak. So no single entity is forced to minimize costs to survive. Okay, this is a heavily simplified thought experiment, of course. The capitalism defender will point to how the store will use that additional money to invest in new technology, which in turn creates new jobs in a new industry, which then trickles down to everyone and so on. But this is a myth. First of all, there is no hard written rule that makes new jobs appear at the same rate as old ones disappear. Second of all, trickle down is a myth, which by now nobody should believe in. But third, why is it only capitalists, a tiny minority of people raking in all of the surplus value that can make those investment decisions? There is nothing that prevents the majority of people to make decisions. It's not just billionaires who can create opportunities for labor. This is why, quote, true democracy under capitalism is always a farce. It is always a tiny group of people making the most important decisions in a society. But more importantly, it is still a capitalist allocation of labor. It is not one based on human needs and ecology. It is one based on the maximum appropriation of wealth by the few. And you cannot consciously direct economic activity to degrow. The capitalist system always seeks to maximize the expenditure of labor. However, under a socialist system, society decides when and if the amount of labor needs to be shortened. It is perfectly possible to not minimize labor if people decide to expand productive or research activity. A socialist society who wants to remain within planetary boundaries can expand sectors, but it can do so consciously and according to ecology and human needs. For instance, you might decide to grow research in the healthcare sector or build public libraries and parks, all of which generate way less ecological pressure than just expanding the SUV sector, private jets, single-use plastics, or building new stadiums for World Cups. And remember that scaling down those harmful industries wouldn't just scale down the goods that are produced and the according labor, but all the factories, the machinery, the logistics which need to be produced for them. So degrowth is not about constraining our lives in this essential way. In what way is the reduction in labor time something that restrains our quality of life? And not that there was any need to provide studies to prove how reducing labor time has a massive positive impact on people's well-being. 
But if you're interested in that, then you will find an overwhelming body of evidence showing how more leisure time is good for our mental health, for our physical health, for just just about everything. We've been accustomed to equate progress with incremental improvements of iPhones or new Netflix shows, but we don't talk enough about how valuable our own time is. Time to spend with friends to read, to be creative, or just do nothing. And what about the objection that if people have more leisure time that they automatically consume or go on holidays and thus even increase their emissions? This again is a claim that is empirically wrong and doesn't hold up in theory either. It is in fact those people who work more who tend to produce more environmental pressure, relying on food deliveries, high-speed commute or travel, fast fashion, and so on. Studies have found that working longer is directly correlated to greater consumption of environmentally intensive products, and that people with more leisure time tend to spend it toward activities that are less environmentally intensive, such as sports, spending time, with your loved ones, uh, learning, creative activity, volunteering, and the difference is massive. What about bureaucracy? It's funny when people say bureaucracy is a huge problem of a centrally planned economy. Think about all the bureaucracy today. The bureaucracy capitalism requires is massive. The bureaucracy just to manage huge companies in their efforts to outcompete each other through massive marketing investments or the massive financial sector just shifting around numbers while sacking in a large part of the surplus value produced. Without competition, there's no need to make these huge investments in, say, marketing, to be in this constant war of outcompeting others. And likewise, imagine all the reductions in military spending if imperialists wouldn't find themselves in constant competition for resources and spheres of influence. Think about the bullshit jobs people are forced to do today and all the waste and necessary commute they entail. Planning and management is already being done under capitalism. It's just privatized and under a market system. There are far fewer people who need to do administration in socialism. Think about an economic system in which higher quality stuff is made that doesn't break immediately. And if it breaks, repair is highly affordable without paying extra for corporate profits and their licenses or property of brands. The fashion industry is especially emblematic. Ultra-fast fashion and commodities as status competition. Consumption fueled by always wanting to have the newest stuff. Think about housing and how decommodification will benefit the vast majority of people. All the labor which would become unnecessary if people didn't have to pay rent like today. All the homelessness that would be eradicated. Think about food waste. The US alone wastes about half of its food and it's in direct relation to the for-profit logic. Close to 1 billion people are starving worldwide. Hunger is the leading cause of death among young children around the world. Yet 1.3 billion tons of food, enough to feed 3 billion people, are wasted every year. There are discussions going on in the climate movement after the realization that while the mass protest movement did bring awareness in the global north, there need to be different tactics now that we've realized politics hasn't changed very much. The tactics being discussed are, for instance, whether or not violence should be deployed or not. So destroying pipelines, smashing windows of corporate banks, eco-terrorism and so on. However, if green capitalism is a lie, then strategies to prevent and mitigate climate breakdown are strategies to bring about socialism. So while we need to move away from fossil fuels, if the economic system doesn't change, nothing changes. 
So why not consider the strategy and tactics of those who have been thinking about and actually changing the economic system over the last centuries? Revolutionaries around the world who are currently fighting against imperialism and fighting for the environment. You don't change society through single acts of protests or acts of terrorism. You change it through revolution. The question of violence is important, but destroying a pipeline won't do much if it's not embedded within a greater strategy for achieving state power and changing the underlying mode of production, which is killing this planet day by day. This video series focused on global warming and emissions, which is just one aspect of how the system is destroying the world, and it's likely the most urgent one. But capitalism destroys the planet in many ways, which are all interconnected. Think about biodiversity loss, fresh water use, or ocean acidification. The ecosystem which we're part of is very sensitive and highly interconnected. Small changes can lead to massive domino effects, which are impossible to predict and which are scary. But if one thing is certain, it is that we must get rid of this morbid system as fast as possible. If you've seen the movie Don't Look Up, you'll maybe remember the scene at the end before the comet destroys human civilization, in which the character played by Leonardo DiCaprio says that they have tried everything they could do to make the world understand that they have to stop this comet, but they haven't done everything. What they've done is a campaign of awareness to force a policy, namely to nuke the comet. But climate change isn't like that. In order to protect the environment, there needs to be a vast social transformation, a change in the class nature of the state itself, which goes beyond an act of a peaceful awareness-raising campaign. It takes serious revolutionary efforts on a global scale. The question of climate change is fundamentally about power about taking political power, not just to live better and to survive, but in order to determine our future ourselves. Maybe we won't stop 1.5 in the short time we have, but we should do our best to prevent this anyway. Because stopping global warming at a later point is also essential to minimize the disaster for the vast majority of people. Many people, have become very pessimistic seeing how this urgent problem isn't being addressed. But thinking the world will end anyway because humans are incapable to understand such long-term and more complex problems isn't only so-called doomerism, which doesn't help anyone, but it is objectively wrong because people are capable of understanding the climate issue. It's not really that complicated once you understand some concepts. If you are not as affected by global warming today, you will most certainly be in the near future. And don't just not care about it because you yourself are not as affected. Don't give up and let the weakest in this world suffer and die at the hands of the capitalist predators. Be hopeful and be an optimist, but in a realist way, for taking political power, for revolutionary change. We're in the middle of an extinction event. There's no need to wait until more people die and suffer. There's no need to wait until material conditions become ripe for fundamental change. The material conditions for revolutionary change are here and they have been for a long time. So thank you so much for listening. And I will end with a quote by Friedrich Engels. Thus, at every step we are reminded that we by no means rule over nature like a conqueror over a foreign people, like someone standing outside nature, but that we, with flesh, blood and brain, 
belong to nature.